On today's World Insight, big test for COVID-19 vaccines in the pipeline. How far research on safety and efficacy has gone from the head of the International Vaccine Institute. What will its real world effectiveness be? And Chinese cinema's road to recovery. Film industry insiders tell us how movie makers cope with the pandemic. And welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. We begin today's program with the latest on COVID-19 pandemic and the race for a vaccine or vaccines. With the fastest spreading global outbreak, no one is safe unless everyone is safe. This is the reason why the World Health Organization, WHO, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, or known as CEPI, and the GABI, the Vaccine Alliance, all led to create COVAX the COVID-19 vaccine's global access. It is a world effort to develop, to make, and to equitably distribute a coronavirus vaccine or vaccines. Over 170 countries and vaccine researchers are engaged in COVAX, and today China said it signed up for the program. What is the significance of this decision? What are the prospects of global vaccine R&D and distribution? For answers, I talked to Jeremy Kim, the Director General of the International Vaccine Institute. And I'm joined by Jeremy Kim, the Director General of the International Vaccine Institute. So Dr. Kim, what a pleasure to see you once again. It's always nice to see you again. So many questions. Uh, Leading up uh, to the end of the year regarding vaccine, let me start by asking you, how much do you think a COVAX would eventually function as many people wish it to be? Well, I think I'm hoping personally uh, that COVAX is fully functional. The world does need a, um, a certain level of supply of, of COVID-19 vaccines by the end of 2021. 20% is a minimum. Ideally, we would like to have more than that. So COVAX is not necessarily too big to fail, but it really should be considered too important to fail. So the participation of major uh, powers around the world is really critical to its success. Uh, there are two platforms it operates with. One is so-called a facility. The other is called a, uh, MAC, if I remember right. Uh, so how does it work? eventually for poor countries and rich countries alike? So in the first phase of, of COVAX, uh, countries should receive um, an amount of vaccine equal to roughly 20% of their need. And this would apply to wealthier countries as well as low and middle income countries. The first allocation, I think, will be 3%. That's the, been the current estimate of, of the need and countries will need to prioritize. If at the end of 2021 there isn't sufficient supply, then COVAX will, uh, will prioritize theoretically by country. Although again, I think there's a lot of discussion that needs to go on. And you know, just to make the point that 150 countries, actually maybe even 170 countries now have signed on, signed expressions of interest. But really the devil will be in the details as we say in English, mm -hmm. that there are still lots of negotiations that have to occur in order to make COVAX a reality. What kind of negotiations? In what kinds of details? How many devils do we so, have? <laughs> <laughs> that's, good. that's a great question. So I'm not party to any of those agreements, um, but every country will need to sign a series of agreements uh, with COVAX in order to ensure that the, you know, the vaccine um, will be supplied. You know, I'm sure there are going to need to be agreements around uh, the donation of funds for COVAX because COVAX will be operating um, you know, as a organization that requires commitment of funds and actually has to receive the funds from the nations that have committed uh, funding. So, and then there are going to need to be agreements around, you know, receipt of vaccines and which vaccines. And so I think, you know, at least the countries that, that, that I'm aware of, um, the discussions are ongoing and they will be detailed. 
And you know, we're, we're in a global pandemic. The Gates Foundation has already estimated that if we don't have a mechanism to, uh, for equitable distribution, that we could see twice the number of anticipated deaths globally. So we really need to get this mechanism fixed and we really need the participation of global leaders. China has committed uh, through the words of Chinese President Xi Jinping that once a important uh, uh, vaccine comes into being that can be recognized by the world, then it will become a global public good. Now, what is the difference between China's uh, commitment already being made uh, to, let's just say, having the commitment and also join COVAX? Yes, so the commitment is a very important first step. And there may even be more than one Chinese vaccine uh, that eventually is WHO pre-qualified and, and would be eligible for participation in COVAX. So China has an important role to play. You know, the Chinese government commitment was an important first step. It would be important also to show solidarity with other countries in the world, which doesn't necessarily only include low and middle income countries. Uh, high income countries have also volunteered to support the COVAX facility. So in this case, it's a, a joint commitment, global solidarity around the idea that COVID-19 vaccines, when they become available, need to be distributed with a view towards some equity. How do you see China United States, uh, given your knowledge of the circle, uh, working closely with CEPI, Gavi, certainly WHO on the vaccine issue, uh, have been approaching uh, the possibility of joining? And what are the issues for both sides? I mean, for either of the country. So I think certainly relationships between the two countries have been strained. Um, and, and that's not an understatement at all. Um, but really, as we approach global, global calamities, whether it's Ebola or COVID-19, um, I think that, that at least our, our best guess is that we work best when we work together. And when it is really something that threatens everybody, uh, then you know everyone needs to pitch in and help, and and this would apply whether it's something like COVID-19 or something that really affects us all, like global warming. I mean, these international solutions are going to be important for transnational problems, and I think that the one thing that this pandemic has shown is that infectious diseases remain a very important transnational problem mm -hmm. for which transnational solutions, international agreements, are going to be necessary in order to ensure that that vaccine solution when it's available is going to be available in the parts of the world that need it. Do we know about herd immunity as to how much percent of the population once having vaccine will make the world eventually having a herd immunity? Earlier, I've been talking to China CDC people. Uh, the number was not clear at the time when I talked to them, but there were suspicion about 60 to 70 percent for the COVID-19 virus. Now, what is your latest uh, assessment? If I were going to tell you the big questions the day after one company or another announces that it has a vaccine that is safe and efficacious, herd immunity would be one of the key questions because we don't necessarily anticipate that all the vaccines are the same. So for instance, if this were just a, if we didn't have a vaccine and all we had um, was a, a disease that was running through society, then the estimate is that, you know, when roughly 60 to 70% of people are infected, then we would have herd immunity and the disease would begin to die out. And, you know, there were countries and Sweden would be one of them that had initially thought that they would escape uh, from, from COVID-19 by allowing the population to reach herd immunity naturally. And it resulted in a substantial number of deaths. Yeah. Vaccines offer the potential for herd immunity uh, without the deaths because vaccines in, in essence work by imitating a disease without making you sick. Mm. Um, and the hope is that when we have a vaccine that it will demonstrate the same kind of protection that natural infection does but it's not necessarily guaranteed. Mm. And so one of the big questions that will come up after we have, after you know, a company says in a large trial, 30,000 people, 15,000 people got vaccine, 15,000 people got placebo. We followed them for six to 12 months. We've, you know, we followed them very closely. And yes, the vaccine has an efficacy of 60%. We're very proud. We're very happy. It's also safe. Great. But the real question will be now, when we take that vaccine and we're not in a clinical trial anymore, but we're vaccinating 
millions of people around the world, right. what will its real world effectiveness be? And they could be different. Mm -hmm. So as an example, the oral cholera vaccine that IBI helped to develop has an efficacy of 55%. But when you use that vaccine in an Indian city and vaccinate 50% you know, of the population, the effectiveness is 85%. So the two are not necessarily directly related, but it gets to the real question of herd immunity. Mm. And that is going to be critical evidence to generate, and, and the vaccines may be different. So as we think about you know, now, not three months from now, but now six and nine months from now, we're really going to need to start generating evidence around effectiveness. Which means even by the end of the 2021, with ideal situation as COVAX, has planned out, uh, we still would not have a relatively safe world. Is that what you're trying to say? Yes. Okay. Um, so, exactly. So, as you pointed out, um, if vaccine is available, and if, if we have more than one vaccine that's even better, um, we will reach the target faster. But the current target for COVAX will not take us near um, what we think we need for herd immunity to be established. It will be a few years. Uh, right. before we reach the levels that, that we need in order to begin to assume that we have some sort of herd protection. But the other important question is, you know, we, we didn't rush. Uh, we accelerated the process of vaccine development. So what would normally be a five to 10 year process was done in 12 to 18 months. So at the end of the day, we may have a vaccine that protects and is safe, mm. but we will not have necessarily had time to optimize everything. So it could be that in subsequent studies, the day after efficacy, we're going to say, well, you know what? The immune responses at six months don't look so great. Maybe we're going to have to boost people. And then the question will be, so how much do we give? If a person got the Sinovac vaccine, um, could they get the can Sinovac vaccine as a right. boost? So we won't know the answers to those questions either. And, you know, you know, can you mix vaccines? Will all vaccines be the same? Right. These are kinds yeah. of questions, optimizing the dose, the schedule, the schedule for the boost, are all questions that need to be answered the day after. Um, and you know, they're, they're critically important with effectiveness, with long-term safety. These are going to be the things that we need to look at nine months from now, two years from now. And we'll still be working on getting rid of COVID at that time. We have seen, for example, the latest FDA uh, policy regarding uh, vaccine candidates have been shifting somewhat towards stricter rules rather than earlier uh, relatively looser rules. So given where you are, how do you see the global uh, policy shifting as we speak uh, when we are entering in their 12-3 of at least the nine promising vaccines worldwide? And also, we are also entering into a stage in which people are becoming more suspicious about whether they should trust the rushed vaccine and a season of flu all at the same time. So point number one is everyone should be vaccinated for the flu also, mm -hmm. I think. But, the, um, but, but you raise another very uh, important question, and that gets to um, the emergency use policies. So the US FDA said, all right, so for us to issue emergency use authorization, you not only have to show that it's safe and effective to the time point where you looked, right. but we're not going to issue something until you can tell us, um, you can give us two month safety follow up information right. after the last dose is received by the last participant in the trial. And that's taking a very conservative and, and you know, um, some people would say a very correct view. And also placebos being a part of the right. numbers being supplied. And, right, and placebos would, would, would are, are part of the trials that, would, that we have Got it. Um, going on now. Mm. So that's the U.S. emergency use policy. Mm. And, you know, other um, organizations like the EMA are undergoing ro what they call rolling reviews of data with the different companies. So will they apply a slightly different standard? Perhaps. Will they have the same requirement for two months of follow-up data on every subject? Again, um, perhaps, but perhaps not. Um, every country uses, or every organization uses a slightly different standard. That's right. um, but safety and efficacy are really key for, for emergency use because really if the vaccine isn't safe and it has potentially unknown side effects that are manifest in the first two months after vaccination, um, you know, 
better to have a volunteer under close scrutiny of a clinical trial than to have them, you know, unmonitored. We have seen the barometer of time, uh, for example, in U.S. politics regarding vaccine, have been so much related to the presidential candidates' debate and also uh, presidential candidates' uh, uh, policies so far. Now, you earlier uh, talking about the COVAX uh, platform and suggesting uh, probably the deadline have to be postponed to another time next year. So how do you see the danger of politics having a relatively bigger say? You know, I think that we may have an answer on a safe and efficacious vaccine. You know, does one of the vaccines actually protect against infection or disease? And is it safe? Probably by November to December or maybe early January. So I think that that timeline is, is correct. When will the supply, so probably in the U.S., maybe by mid-year next year, mid-2021, you'll start to see adequate levels of supply. Um, will uh, COVAX be able to achieve its 2 billion doses by the end of 2021? That's the hope. Hmm. Um, now, around the regulatory agencies, and again, you know, you see the, the lure of vaccines, right? We're in the, the U.S. is in the middle of one of the worst uh, pandemics it's had for a century. Yeah. You know, 200,000 Americans have died. It's been difficult to impose a, you know, a, a social solution or political solution the way China has with, with mandatory wearing of masks and, and, um, and enforcement. Um, so for them, a vaccine is, is luring, uh, is, has a special need. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration has always been um, and it has as its mission that the vaccines be safe and effective. And I think that the FDA's uh, issuing of the guidance and finally the White House's uh, approval and uh, or allowing it to be posted was very important because now they've said, all politics aside, these are the requirements that we will follow. So in, in a sense, then, you know, the, the correct procedure to ensure safety and efficacy is now the path forward. Going into the flu season, though, uh, Dr. Kim, many are worried because uh, China, for example, have... Uh, a huge populated uh, society, and flu has always been a big problem. So, uh, Dr. Kim, how do you see this part of the world? Because now we can't travel much, but rather only within the region of Northeast Asia, it seems, or within the country itself. How will the COVID distancing and mask requirements um, impact uh, the transmission of the flu? We don't know. Mm. Um, South Africa had a very light flu season. You know, their seasons are reversed. That's right. So they got through their flu season, but they were also locked down. So they had an additional level of distancing uh, caused by the lockdown. So it's difficult to know. Um, you know, the, the one advantage is that, that vaccine companies in Northeast Asia are able to make uh, significant quantities of flu vaccine. And uh, people in, in Northeast Asia, Japan, China, Korea, you know, probably... Um, are, are people who follow government instructions to use and take vaccines. Mm -hmm. And so if the government recommendation is for, for vaccination, uh, then people get vaccinated. If you understand how vaccines help, um, the idea of using the flu vaccine to keep people out of the hospital, um, to, you know, because of the potential surge in COVID, you know, we don't want to have two surges of, you know, people infected with influenza and people infected with SARS-CoV-2, you know, hitting the hospitals at the same time because that could cause um, significant overcrowding and, and potentially people would, would be neglected. And, and we don't want that to happen either. So this is a part of planning and preparation. And, you know, the countries that have done better um, have not only had more central uh, control over pandemic response, but have also been very good at preparing. We have seen a very interesting editorial coming out of uh, New England Journal of Medicine, a, a, a medical journal that has been uh, very key on science and not politics, suggesting that the magazine itself and its staff and many of its uh, contributors have been firmly committing to a change of president inside one country. So how do you see um, these days uh, the stances of uh, scientists in a time 
when uh, situations are really intense in terms of science versus politics? Interesting question. Um, so I think the most important thing for politicians to realize is that scientists vote also. Mm. Um, but you know, the amazing things uh, that science has generated um, I think are a tribute and, and have been benefiting uh, people uh, medically and, and in, in terms of everyday life. I mean, whether it's, you know, cell phones or, um, you know, the convenience or the cleanliness of uh, battery powered cars or these vaccines that we have or new surgical techniques or new drugs that, that work wonders against cancers that when I started medical school, we could do absolutely nothing about. I mean, these are all advantage, advances funded by research, funded by governments. And you know governments that base a lot of their decisions uh, on data uh, that are generated by scientists. So, you know, I don't encourage people to vote one way or the other. They vote in, in terms of their interest. But you know, science has been a good thing, and it's generated you know um, lots of, of intellectual property and, and revenue for companies and employees. They're high tech. They're green industries. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm a big science cheerleader, um, you know, for, a, a, for the journal, the New England Journal to take a position is, is a bit unusual, mm. um, I, I do say. And, um, but in the end, you know, we do need funding for science. We need uh, for people to understand science. So we need to improve science education. Um, we need to get more people involved in science. We need to train scientists to be better communicators because, you know, it's one thing for me to talk about the immunogenicity of a vaccine and, you know, T cells and B cells. But if people don't understand what I'm saying, then it really doesn't help us at all. I mean, we need to be more persuasive. And, and sometimes we're locked in our labs and so focused on the work in front of us that we don't, that we forget that science is contributing to society in a way that we can't measure. And we need to be active participants and advocate for science and explain to people why it's important and how it will protect them. And, and by doing that, then hopefully we raise not only um, the credibility of science, but we get more people to understand that what we're doing is not um, is not bad, but it has significant uh, and and very important and good consequences for countries um, that support science. Dr. Kim, I'm so glad you are both working inside the lab and walking out of it talking to us. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure.